Greetings, everyone. We are excited to kick off this next session of Atlas Core Immersion. We have a very dynamic speaker today, Sam Vegger, and a little intro on him. Sam's North Star is helping young people own their voice and power to make a difference. He is the executive director and co-founder of Millennium Campus Network, MCN. He co-founded this nonprofit in his Brandeis University dorm room and has led MCN for 12 years. MCN in the United Nations Academic Impact present the Millennium Fellowship, a leadership development program for undergraduates advancing the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The Millennium Fellowship drew more than 15,000 applicants from over 1,400 campuses this year. The fellowship is active on campuses in 20 nations, including at several AAC and U member institutions. In addition to supporting Millennium Fellows, Sam serves as an advisor to the Executive Director of UN Women. He is a 2008 graduate of Brandeis University and has received honorary doctorates from Becker College and Monmouth College. This year, Sam is a student again. He is a graduate student at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, where he is also a Gleitzman Fellow at its Center for Public Leadership. You can engage with Sam on social media at Sam Vegger. And so without further ado, we welcome you, Sam, and look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Abby. And uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon. Good evening. Um, it's such a pleasure to be with you and uh, especially meaningful for me to see Scott, uh, to see his face pop up, uh, who is such a role model uh, and leader and mentor in this space to me and, and many others. Um, Atlas Core is a community that has stood out to me for a long time. Uh, so I know that you all are in good company and uh, I wanted to just spend this time with you sharing uh, part of my story and some concrete lessons that I hope will help you on your journeys of social impact. So the, the title for this presentation is Building Your Professional Network and really where I actually wanted to focus is on bolstering your social impact career. Um, particularly in an unjust world. And <clears throat> that's the, the space that we find ourselves in, in a world with COVID-19, with racial injustice, with so many challenges uh, that undoubtedly you are seeing locally and we are feeling globally. Um, my focus has always been at the undergraduate level working with university students. Um, so many of you are probably a little, you know, you're further ahead in your career and trajectory. Um, but I'm hoping that some of these lessons will be applicable. Uh, and if, if nothing else will reaffirm the things that you already know to be true uh, and, and really want to set as a North Star in your own journeys. So Millennium Campus Network MCN helps undergraduates change the world. Um, that has really been at the core of what I do. Uh, and I want to share a little bit of how that how that story begins for me. So uh, growing up, I was quite shy. Uh, I had two friends in high school. Um, I really didn't fit in. And um, I don't know if that's the case for any of you. If it is, maybe, you know, it'll resonate. I, I had, a, a, there was a period of time where uh, in the school cafeteria at lunchtime, I would actually go home because I didn't really have anyone to sit with and I was too shy to ask anybody. And, um, and so I'd eat, I would eat alone. Uh, and so high school, secondary school for me, was really lonely. And I, in a U.S. context, this may make sense in some places around the world, it will as well. We had prom growing up and uh, I was too shy to ask the person that I liked. So I got set up on, on a blind date for senior prom. That was my mo one date. Uh, all, all of high school, all of secondary school. I applied to a bunch of universities. Uh, most of them rejected me. Um, so at this point, you're probably wondering, why did Atlas Core invite Sam to speak? Um, but for me, you know, I got into university and things changed. Uh, and things changed in part by reading two books. And so these two books, Mountains Beyond Mountains and The End of Poverty, changed my life. Uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains tells the story of Dr. Paul Farmer and the organization Partners in Health. When Paul was 23 years old, he actually stole medical supplies from Harvard, brought him down to Haiti, started working as a doctor, as a practitioner, 
uh, has now been working more than three decades in nine countries on the cutting edge of global health equity. Uh, I'm sure for many of you rec recall Ebola in West Africa in 2014, Partners in Health was a part of that response. They've now been doing contact tracing here in Massachusetts, um, really global impact through PIH. And then I read The End of Poverty by Jeff Sachs, uh, learned that over 700 million people live on less than $1.90 a day. And really what, what I took from these books is both the challenges and complexities of our world, but also the role, the role that individuals can play to make a difference. And so I put down those books, I picked up the phone, I cold called Jeff Sachs. I went down to Columbia University two days later, met with his team. I said, look, I'm 19 years old. Uh, I'm a sophomore in university. I don't have many answers, but I know our generation can do more. I know we can do more to tackle extreme poverty, to advance the UN Millennium Development Goals, now these 17 Sustainable Development Goals. I want to figure out what role we can play as a generation in advancing the goals. Came back to campus, started small-scale public health fundraisers. Then in the fall of 2007, convened students from across the city of Boston and, and I said, you know, we're all focused on injustice and making a difference, but we're doing this work in silos. Those silos minimize impact, minimize the fusion of knowledge. What would happen if we collaborated? Uh, six months later, we had our first summit at MIT with a thousand student leaders from around the world with Paul Farmer, Jeff Sachs, uh, John Legend, the head of USAID, Paul, Jeff, and John joined our board of advisors and said, we're in. Let, let's help you build a student network on poverty. I said, I'm 20 years old. I'm not quite sure what I'm doing yet, but, but let's give it a shot. And so we launched Millennium Campus Network, MCN, as a platform for undergraduates making a difference. Uh, and we launched MCN in our college dorm rooms at university. Uh, that was 13 years ago. And so over the last 13 years, we've helped over 7,000 young people have deeper impact in community, 75% of our alumni are now in social impact careers in the public and private sectors. And, you know, for me, the goal, I mean, we've had two Rhodes Scholars, two Truman Scholars, uh, incredible young leaders emerge from this community. But uh, I know that we will have made it, so to speak, uh, when, when we have Atlas Core Fellows, when our alumni go on to serve uh, and engage meaningfully in Atlas Core. So that's, that's really what we're working towards. So <clears throat> these are a couple of images I just wanted to lift up from, from our community that are really meaningful to me because Millennium Fellows are advancing the SDGs much in the same way you all are having impact uh, in your community locally and now globally. And so at the University of Benin in Nigeria, Millennium Fellows leveraging solar power to provide electricity to community members at night, 106 community members at night. Uh, at UDEM in Mexico, students leveraging their business uh, acumen, what they're learning in the classroom to support local artisans uh, and ensuring they have sustainable livelihoods. And a number of universities as well, uh, including at the University of the Ozarks and others, students who are creating community farms, Millennium Fellows creating community farms to ensure and tackle food insecurity on campus and in the local community. So these are grassroots projects and you might think, well, why does that matter? And maybe even you're in Atlas Core right now and you're thinking, you know, how powerful am I? And I think one thing we've acknowledged over these 13 years is you might feel like you're just one person, but you're part of a movement. You know, now you're part of Atlas Core, you're part of a really powerful, dynamic, diverse community. And, and for us with the Millennium Fellowship, these are just a couple of, uh, of examples of leaders who have gone on to build organizations. Carissa Shaw at the University of Pennsylvania created Cyber Sensibility. The, the challenge she identified was around cyber bullying. And so created a, a digital curriculum, delivers it now it was to 600 elementary and middle school students here in the US, used the Millennium Fellowship community to identify ambassadors and scale the program now to India. Um, so. I just wanted to lift that up because in terms of building a professional network, one of the best assets you have is literally the Atlas Core community, the people right around you, your other, your, your other fellows, your other team members, core members, everyone around you um, 
may know somebody, may be able to help connect dots for an initiative you're passionate about uh, and, and spread the word. And so we've seen that with the Millennium Fellowship and in an era of COVID-19 where people are, uh, where projects are disrupted and initiatives are disrupted. Um, looking at this as an example, Philemon Kuza at the University of Ibadan created the Open Campus Initiative. He identified that a number of students produce incredible research and, and a thesis and then once they produce it, uh, it maybe if it's really good, it sits in the school library in hard copy, but it doesn't end up in a digital format. And so a lot of people can't access it. So he said, why don't we just set this up in such a way that people can access, uh, access students research di digitally started on his campus and now starting to scale up in Nigeria. So those are two projects I wanted to lift up. And so in aggregate, these are just some numbers to take a look at. 805 Millennium Fellows last year, 422 unique projects, volunteered nearly 100,000 hours collectively, positively impacted more than half a million people's lives in 15 countries. I share these numbers just for the, the sake of giving some context for the advice I want to share. Because again, you might think, hey, what can one person do? But when you start to realize you're part of a much larger ecosystem of change makers, uh, there is such power in that and collectively we can reach thousands even millions of people's lives uh, in really positive profound ways so all that to say i wanted to i wanted to spend you know just these 10 minutes giving you that context because otherwise my advice would seem kind of uh, out, out of place but knowing what we've done over these last 13 years and how we've grown community um, i wanted to share some very concrete advice uh, and I always do this in the form of story. I find such power in story. Um, <clears throat> and so these are concrete lessons that I hope will, will help you in your journeys. And what I'd love to do is just spend about 15 minutes uh, sharing these and then really do Q&A uh, because you all have your own lived experiences and insights. Um, to be an Atlas Core is a massive honor. So I know you're doing a lot right already. So I really want to take as much time as possible to, to learn from you. So in terms of lessons learned, um, the first one really centers on an experience I had when I was 18 years old. And this will affirm so much of what you all are already doing. Uh, I was walking on the street in Washington, D.C., and uh, it was in the bitter cold in January. And I came across uh, a man who was homeless. And typically growing up, uh, I had been conditioned to almost honestly ignore somebody who was homeless, walk right by them, pretend they didn't exist, not make eye contact. And at 18 years old, I had this moment where I decided to do something different. And um, I sat down with this man, we shared lunch for about 45 minutes. And 20 minutes into the conversation, um, <clears throat> I, I asked him, I, I said, you know, forgive me for asking, but I don't have the lived experience or the context to understand. I said, if I could ask one question, how do you survive? And this man looked back at me and he looked up at the passerby and he said, I'm not afraid to talk to anyone. I'm not afraid to look up at those above me and ask for help. Never be afraid to talk to anyone. Never be afraid to talk to anyone. <clears throat> this is the single best piece of advice I've received. I'm 34 now. It's the best piece of advice I've received in 34 years. It did not come from uh, a professor or a world leader or, uh, uh, you know, frankly, from the Millennium Fellowship or from a program like Atlas Core, it came from actually engaging people, an individual in community. Um, and so often in community, we're taught, uh, we, we see people through labels and we devalue people, we dehumanize people. And so this moment, both the advice and who it came from changed my life. Uh, I took this advice and I applied it, but I also re realized that so much of what I've been taught growing up was wrong. Uh, and so that was an important lesson at, at 18 that really set me on this journey. So I took this advice, never be afraid to talk to anyone. And in 2010, I was at a conference, CGIU in Miami. There was an actor there named Cal Penn. And, uh, and Cal had left Hollywood for a little bit to work for the White House for President Obama on, on youth engagement. And I saw him and he was about to go on stage and everyone else was kind of too shy to, to go say hi. And, uh, and I thought about this in this moment. I said, never be afraid to talk to anyone. 
Um, <clears throat> and so I saw him and I, I mustered up the courage. I got the courage. I walked right over. I reached out and I said, hi, I'm Sam Vagar from Boston, Massachusetts. I head Millennium Campus Network, MCN. We help undergraduates make a difference. And, uh, and Cal said, you know, that's, that's really great. Uh, and I want to kind of unpack a couple of very concrete lessons within this, because when you think about building your professional network, uh, getting these little pieces right can pay huge dividends. So when you connect with somebody, whether it's the CEO, whether it's Scott or Abby or somebody at the Atlas Core team, or whether it's another member of the community, or whether it's a mentor or guest speaker or somebody else in your community, when you have that point of connection, um, definitely ask, you know, ask to follow up. Say, hey, I'd love to follow up with you. What's the best way to do that? Um, if you have business cards, then what I typically do, oftentimes I've seen people make the mistake of saying, here's my card, please. It's like, I'd love to follow up or they'll put in a chat box. Here's my contact information. Follow up with me. The likelihood of that working out is like a million to one. I've done this enough times. I can tell you it just doesn't work from experience. But what I would encourage you to do is one, if you have business cards, say, hey, I'd love to connect further with you. Ask for their card. Do you have a card? Hold out your own card. Make an exchange. There's almost like a feeling of reciprocity. Ask for the card, then offer your card. Go for the exchange. If they don't have a card, say, hey, can I, can I write down your email address? Have a piece of paper and a pen ready. Have them write down their email address. Make the ask. The worst they're going to say is, no, I don't give out my contact information. No harm, no foul. But oftentimes, and I know it's different in every community and context and culture, but oftentimes people will will reciprocate. They will share contact information. And when you get contact information from someone, and I know this sounds so obvious, but so few people actually do it, follow up within 24 hours. Follow up within 24 hours. Uh, this sounds so basic, but I can tell you it's probably, you know, two out of 10 people that actually do that. And what happens if you don't do that, if you don't follow up right away is you wait a week or two weeks and you follow up and you say, hey, I had a great conversation um, with you or you had a great, you know, you gave a great presentation. Think about it. Imagine if I had done that with Cal Penn. Cal Penn's meeting hundreds or thousands of people a week. By the time I follow up, I'm forgotten. In this moment that we're connecting here and now, Atlas Core, in this moment, we have a connection. So leverage it in the moment, follow up within 24 hours. Um, and believe me, I'm guilty of it too. It's hard. You get so many contacts, especially at an event or in an orientation or in a, in a lab like this, so many different people you connect with, but really prioritize. And if there are people you want to connect with, make a point of within 24 hours, follow up. When you follow up, nobody needs like a five paragraph email. Keep it really short and sweet to the point. Uh, my, my emails are usually five sentences and the first sentence is an affirmation. Here's what they shared that really resonated for me. Uh, something that they said, some piece of advice, or I even go on YouTube. I watch the, a talk they've given and I hyperlink it and I say, this sentence resonated for this reason. So share that feedback of what resonated, uh, share in a sentence who you are. Like I share my North star is helping young people own their voices and power to make a difference. That's why I had MCN and then a, a concrete call to action. Like, Hey, I would love to follow up. Uh, we, I'd love 30 minutes of your time for your advice and counsel on the work that I'm doing uh, specifically because of your leadership. And if there's more content that I want to include, I dump it below my signature. I say, you can see more below my signature, but really keep that message concise, concrete. I know these things sound so simple, um, but getting these right. I I've done this now with, so many different global leaders, um, whether, whether it's leaders within the UN system or leaders in the private sector, and it works. And so it may not work precisely for every one of you, but I wanted to share this. So that's what I did with Cal Penn. And I followed up um, within 24 hours and I said, hey, Cal, would love to connect further. Two weeks later, went down to the White House, met with his team, um, which was you know, met with one of his colleagues, sat down, shared more on MCN, got their advice. And then I learned, keep following up. You know, I, we followed up every couple months with Cal Penn. I said, here are the updates from us. What's new with you? And, uh, and there's a simple question that you can ask in almost any business setting, in almost any setting that really can help equalize the relationship, especially for as young professionals, 
Uh, sometimes we come into spaces and we need something. We need a job, we need an internship, we need funding for our ventures. And so it becomes really centered on our needs. But there's a simple question you can ask that really helps equalize the relationship. It's five magic words. And I'm curious if anyone wants to take a guess, uh, either on mute or if you wanna just put in the chat box, just five magic words. It's, it's a simple question that you can ask in any business setting um, that really helps to equalize the relationship and, and show that you have a lot to offer. Tasia Stewart, uh, Tasia, how can I help you? Uh, I don't know if you've seen my presentation before, but that's amazing because that is verbatim. Um, that is verbatim the, the question. And so I'll, I'll skip here and I'll just, I'll jump right to it. I'm going to skip that story because you're, that's incredible. Um, I can just tell you, Tasia, that's just indicative of Atlas Core because I've done this presentation hundreds of times. No one ever gets it first. So that's amazing. Um, wow. So that's incredible. I'm telling you something and I'm affirming something you already know and hopefully you all do. Um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. So, uh, you know, why you ask this question, how can I help you is because, um, is because in a setting, again, you're coming in, you have a lot of needs, but when you ask, how can I help you? It, it really indicates two things. One, it indicates that you value the other person. Uh, it indicates that you value their, their agenda, their priorities. Every person has their own agenda and priorities. And it's important to name that and know that and acknowledge it. And two, by saying, how can I help you? It also shows that you have a lot to offer. Uh, even as a young professional, you know, maybe, maybe a company or an NGO or a foundation needs the perspective of young voices uh, and young perspectives. And, and maybe you can organize uh, a focus group or a survey or find other ways to connect young voices. There are so many different ways that you can plug in, but you won't know unless you ask. And so framing it around what that person's agenda is, um, it also just gives you more information. And they may say, no, you know, I don't need anything. But even just by asking the question, it helps, it helps open up the dialogue. Um, so that advice was from Ron Cordes of the Cordes Foundation. It profoundly changed my life. Um, when, when we followed up with Cal Penn, I kept asking, how can I help you? And for the first few months, Cal said, hey, we're good. You know, we're at the White House. We've got things figured out. <laughs> and uh, I mean, not quite in those words, but uh, after 10 months, Cal reached out and he said, Sam, we're, we're launching an initiative called White House, White House Youth Roundtables. We want to know what young Americans care about, and we want to invite you to, to organize roundtables in groups about this size all over the U.S. And so we organized the MCN community on campuses around the country, and we said, you know, what are the issues you care about? Please share those out. And so young people documented why they cared about global development, global health, uh, climate change, why do these things matter to them? How are they working to address these issues locally? We shared this back with Cal Penn and about three weeks later, Cal said, well, Sam, do you want to come to a debrief at the White House and share what you learned? And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm too busy for that. Um, I'm just kidding. You would never, never turn down that opportunity to go to the White House. So, so we, there's, we, we kind of planned this out and, uh, and there were 10 of us, 10 national youth leaders from around the country. We head to the White House. Um, I don't know if any, if any of you have been, I'm sure Scott has, I'm sure some of you have, uh, Abby and others. So we go to, we go to the White House and uh, what, what struck me is it's actually quite small. And we go into the West Wing and President Obama's press secretary, Jay Carney walks by and he says, hey, how are you? And we're like, uh, hey, we're kind of shocked. And then his energy secretary is to our right. We're again, just kind of perplexed and um, not sure what to say. And then we see Cal in the Roosevelt room and he ushers us in. He's like, yeah, come on in. So it's 10 national youth leaders. We sit together around the table in the Roosevelt room, which is just a single table in the room. And we sit down with Cal and we talk for about, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes about the power of young people and, uh, all the different projects that we're working on, whether it's around economic development or homelessness or LGBT rights or uh, uh, gender equality, gender equity work, so many different initiatives that young people are passionate about, but but all linked together in this community. And, and then about halfway through the meeting, 
Cal says, hey, I, I've got to go. I'll be back in, in five minutes. And five minutes later, we're, we're sitting in the Roosevelt room and, and this side door opens up and we all kind of just sit back shocked and bounding in, bounding in comes Bo Obama. The dog comes bounding in and right behind Bo Obama in comes Barack Obama. And he walks in and he says, hi, I'm Barack Obama. We're like, yeah, we know who you are. <laughs> and so he comes in and, <clears throat> and I knew, you know, just be ready for this moment because you never know. And so it's so important to be prepared for every one of these moments. And so the president comes around to shake each of our hands. And as the president comes to shake my hand, I reach out and I said, hi, I'm Sam Vagar from Boston. And then I pull out notes out of my pocket and I say, here are notes for you and the first lady. And he looks down kind of perplexed and I'm sure Secret Service hated me for doing this, but I didn't care because never be afraid to talk to anyone. And, and so we had these handwritten notes for the president and the first lady to get involved with MCN and the community we're building. And you can see here in this photo, he's sitting right across from me here. He's actually, I think, holding the notes in, in this moment. And the advice really is know what you want out of every meeting. Your time is so precious. Um, you are extraordinary leaders to be an Atlas Core. I know you are, you're extraordinary leaders. And so your time is so precious that it's really important to set intention with every meeting uh, through this lab, throughout Atlas Core, throughout your career, um, to really prioritize how you're going to spend your time, uh, who you're going to spend it with. You know, your goals can change. You can go into a meeting with a set agenda, and that can evolve. Um, but I always try with every meeting to know with, with some degree of certainty what I want out of it and, and let that be open uh, as things evolve, as the conversation shapes where things might go. Um, but I always try to come in with intention. And so that's what we did. We had these handwritten notes for the president and the first lady. Um, the president spoke for about 10, 15 minutes about the power of young people, why it's so important not to wait until you're 80 or 90 to give back, but to do it when you're younger, to, to begin this journey. Um, and after he was talking for about 10, 15 minutes, he was like, thank you, thank you. I could tell he's getting ready to go. So I thought, okay. I thought back to that advice, never be afraid to talk to anyone. What can I do in this moment? And so the one thing I could think to do, I, I raised my hand. And just like you all can see my hand in the screen right now, everybody in the room sees my hand. And so the president's like, thank you, thank you. And then he, he sees my hand and it's, I'm, you can see I'm right across from him. It's impossible to ignore. So he said, yeah, Sam, please go ahead. <laughs> and I said, Thank you, Mr. President. I said, you know, your leadership is a bold statement to me. So to be honest, you know, I, I might be older than some of you. I'm not sure. But when I was 10 years old, if you, if you told me somebody named Barack Hussein Obama would be elected president of the United States, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, and I don't think many people would have at the time. And so I said, you know, whether, whether it's Republicans here, Democrats, independents, whatever your politics, your leadership is a bold statement. And um, and I said, those notes are an invitation for you and the first lady to, to get involved in the work we're doing at MCN. The entire room cracks up because I've just pitched the president in front of the whole room. But I didn't care because never be afraid to talk to anyone. Make the most of every opportunity that you have. And so that's, that's what I did. And the president said, thank you. And the moment that I made this pitch, then every other hand shot up. Everyone else was like, pick me, pick me, pick me. And I, I took from that a key lesson, which is it's always hardest to go first. It is always hardest to go first. You all know that you're in Atlas Core. You are the leaders so often in your lives. You're the one stepping up first. So often you're social entrepreneurs when people don't quite understand what that is or why you do what you do. And you feel like maybe you're the only one. Um, I, I, I know how that feels. And in this particular moment, you know, to raise my hand was a little ambitious or audacious, but I just, I figured let's make the most of this. And so every other hand shut up. Now everyone had a comment to make on every issue that they cared about. And, uh, and about a month later, the state department called and they said, Sam, do you want to share your work at MCN with youth and educators and in Bosnia and Herzegovina? So we went six cities, seven days with the embassy all across the country in 2011. Then they called again, 
to go in, to Morocco in 2013, then Bulgaria and North Macedonia in 2015. In 2017, we hosted our first summit internationally uh, in Morocco, 200 young leaders from 36 countries convening together uh, really for cultural exchange and to focus on their work to advance the sustainable development goals. Um, it's, it's opened up my life, but also our network and, and helped us launch initiatives like the Millennium Fellowship, which is now in 20 countries. And my call to action, my one ask would be, I know you all might be a little bit older, but if you know undergraduates, please share the Millennium Fellowship with them because it's entirely free. Uh, it's training connections, credentials for undergraduates making a difference. But this moment in Morocco doesn't happen most likely, if I don't reach out to the President of the United States and say, here's an invitation to get involved, here's what we're working on. And that moment would not have happened if I didn't really know what I wanted out of the meeting and know to make the most of the meeting. And that wouldn't have happened if along the way with Cal Penn, I didn't ask, how can I help you? How can I help you? And keep asking it again and again and really show that I wanted to be there for him and show up in meaningful ways. And that wouldn't have happened if I didn't remember when I saw Cal at that summit to never be afraid to talk to anyone, even whether it's a celebrity or the president, whoever it might be, whoever you're going to come across through Atlas Core and beyond, they're human beings. Everybody is a person with dignity and you can connect with anybody. I, I know sometimes that's hard in different contexts and spaces, but as much as possible, um, I, I've really tried to live that out as best I personally can. And that wouldn't have happened. Never be afraid to talk to anyone if that homeless man hadn't taught me that at 18 years old. And so he changed my life more than anybody else as an 18 year old, uh, really set me on this entire trajectory. And so I, I wanted to leave you with those concrete pieces of advice, you know, to never ask that question or to ask, make that statement, never be afraid to talk to anyone, to ask, how can I help you? And to know what you want out of every meeting, uh, to really apply those things in your life. And those have been, I think, the singular lessons in 13 years that have helped me on this path. Uh, and I wanted to share those with you because you're not Atlas Core, because you're the ones who are leading today, um, and because you know, you're the ones that I really want to partner with and find ways to collaborate with for years to come. So I'll pause there, um, and I'd love to open it up for Q&A, uh, and I'd love to be supportive, and I hope it's not just a one-off conversation. I, I'll share and I'll skip here just to the end so that you have it. I want to encourage you. This is my contact information. That's my email. That's my, uh, that's my number. You can reach out to me on WhatsApp. You can reach out to me over email. Um, WhatsApp's actually the easiest. If you have it, just ping me there. Um, because you're an Atlas Core, I, like, I, I want to show up for you however I can. So I'll pause there. Abby would love to open up for any questions or comments. And um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Amazing. And what great examples and uh, simple actions that make a big difference. Thank you, Sam. Inspiring as always. So yes, we are going to open it up to the audience. And so fellow scholars, we invite you to ask your questions. You can either do so via chat or if you'd like to do so um, via audio, I encourage you to use the reaction, the raise hand function. And when you ask your question, introduce yourself with your name and country you're coming from. And so Sam has a little sense of who he's talking to. So um, this is a great opportunity to seize that day about never be afraid to go first. Um, and I'm actually gonna kick it off, Sam, with a, a question when you're talking about these networks and community. And that's something that we continually talk about with Atlas Core is that you know, we're, we've been an organization almost 15 years and we've had um, uh, almost 800 participants now. And, and thinking about what have you found is really affect your practice for connecting a community such as MCN across years and countries? How do you keep them connected? And how do you just keep people inspired about engaging with one another? Yeah, it's, it's a great question, Abby. I think one thing that we've found to be true is um, giving people very clear roles and responsibilities, concrete roles that are time bound. Um, because a lot of a lot of our alumni will say, "Oh, I want to stay involved," but if it's not concrete, they kind of just walk away because you know life happens, and the the our our community is mostly obviously undergrads, so then they graduate and they have other things happening in life. So concrete ways that we've done this 
this year we had 15,000 applicants. The way that we actually reviewed them, we had 125 alumni on a global admissions committee reviewing those applications. It was something time bound over a couple months where they could be involved meaningfully. Um, and they loved it and we loved it. Like it was a win-win. We couldn't really review all those applications on our own. Um, so it really helped us to, to advance the work. Uh, we have a global curriculum committee that actually helps refine our curriculum year on year. Um, so I think giving people very clear opportunities to engage that are that are time bound and specific um, is relevant. It's been relevant for us to engage alumni and I've seen it work for for other organizations as well. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, another timely question. Uh, I think it is an exciting moment for especially our fellows who are physically located in the United States right now. Obviously, we're, we're nearing a, a political, a, a presidential election, which I think uh, affects the United States and also there's always effects on the world. And, and it, it begs the question about connecting with people who may have different views or um, talking about different topics. And I'm curious to hear your insights about how you engage, specifically when you know you're going to be talking to an audience or an individual that um, you know differs in opinions and how you approach that to create that safe space, to create um, really interactive dialogue so that you can both uh, learn from one another. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, one, I'll just name, you know, I carry privilege as a white male, like, and as an American, there's a lot of privilege that I have and I can walk into different spaces and just kind of be automatically accepted um, in, in a lot of spaces with power. And so that's just something that I name up front. I think it's, um, it's important to, to be cognizant of that um, and to check that privilege as well. I think the, the one kind of universal truth that, that may be powerful in a lot of different spaces uh, is to listen first. Anytime I'm gonna give a presentation, uh, especially in person, um, I spend a lot of time actually just meeting people in the audience. So I never just get up and I say, here's my, my kind of cookie cutter presentation. Like I go and um, I try to just understand like who people are, uh, what, what are, again, what are their priorities? What are their agendas? Uh, and, and speak to those in any kind of presentation or any dialogue we're going to have, affirm those things that people care about, even if they have a different viewpoint, right? Seek to understand that viewpoint, why it matters to them at the core, not just at a surface level, you know, if they're going to spout out, like, here's a talking point I believe in, but to dig a little bit deeper and understand why. Is it some part of their life story or their family that, that really compels them to believe what they do? Is there some way to connect with that? Um, that's, you know, so my biggest advice there would just be to listen first. Um, and as I've learned from other, uh, other mentors in my life, um, sometimes it is okay to walk away. You know, sometimes if you do have completely diverging, divergent viewpoints uh, and the person is incendiary or inflammatory in their statements, you, you don't need to win over everyone. There's a great book that I really enjoyed called The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. And one of the things in the tipping point that stands out to me is to build a social movement, you don't need 100% of people. You don't even need 50%. I think the stat was around 14% of the population, like a, a small minority of people, those early adopters, if they really believe with you, then they can start to move people in the middle and then ultimately late adopters will come on board. And so I would just focus on building really strong ties and trust, especially with the people around you who believe what you believe. Um, especially with respect to movement building, which I'm sure a lot of you are involved in. Great, great insights and great book recommendations. As timely as your insights are, we have uh, this question of the day as kind of a, a team builder. And so today's question was, what are you reading now? And I love that we have three great book recommendations from Sam. So the tipping point, as you just mentioned, and then the two earlier books in the presentation. So fellows I, and scholars, I encourage you to um, check them out. Um, and Sam, another question. So you know, and that related to our current situation and the adaptations we're all making. And so I was wondering how the dynamic of your work, both with MCN and even individually, your approach that you've been talking about today has adapted in our physically distant world that's being virtually driven. 
what changes have you seen and what have you learned? Like, I'd love to hear if there's anything that, that you've been like, wow, I really learned that this does not work and this is more effective. Um, I've learned that the, the power is in community and the power is at the grassroots level. Uh, the biggest mistake we made um, early on was that we tried to just make MCN domestic uh because we wanted to be place-based and understand the place that we're in uh, but we missed a lot of opportunities by doing that and so uh in 2018 we took the millennium fellowship global with the united nations academic impact we partnered and presented it globally and we went from you know uh, i think 1500 applicants in the class of 2018 to 15,000 applicants for the class of 2020 and so many of the, the incredible dynamic leaders and pro programs and initiatives are happening around the world and we miss that um and that's something I, I honestly looking back i regret that we didn't really realize that sooner um that we created this binary construct of either you're international or you're domestic um we're in a global economy we're in a global world uh, clearly like we're all connecting virtually today and so leveraging technology i think is so important um, we do that now so we tr we use a train the trainer model we train two students as campus directors on each campus um we're doing it doing the millennium fellowship in 20 countries i'm learning a lot from millennium fellows and their experience around the world um for me it's powerful as an american because instead of talking about other people and places or you know uh citing something in the news we're learning directly from peers and um, I'm sure it's a similar experience with, with members of Atlas Core, where, you know, all of a sudden, when we're talking about Yemen, we have Millennium Fellows at Al Razi University in Yemen who are tackling malaria in a conflict region. It's one thing to talk about Yemen. So it's another thing to actually hear from people in Yemen about what's happening at the grassroots level and seeing people at the grassroots level as change makers in every community and context. Uh, I think it's so important. And it's great to say that theoretically, and I know a lot of organizations say it theoretically, um, but it's, it's, I think, most powerful to me to actually see that firsthand from other young leaders. Uh, and so there have been a lot of lessons just, uh, I think, challenging our own core assumptions about how we work and why we do what we do uh, and where power really is located. Um, so yeah, a, a lot more. Um, but you know there is there is like very there is a lot of power in zoom there is a lot of power in technology um the world i think is becoming smaller and smaller with technology and i think some of the most innovative organizations like atlas core are really innovating and, and utilizing it to its fullest great i'm going to invite we have a few questions like lined up so radhika and then pratush so radhika Thanks, thanks, Sam, and thanks, Abby, for a very good, uh, you know, volleys of questions, I would say, that you've given to Sam. I, I was very intrigued by one statement, uh, power of grassroots, and, uh, you know, you, we are working on SDGs, and coming from the Indian context, uh, you know, I so resonate when the pandemic arrived, you know, we saw the plight of the informal workers, the migrants, you know, the uh, biggest, in, you know, uh, adversity was faced by them. Uh, you're also talking about power of networks, you know, and the power of fellowship. Uh, I just wanted to know from you um, your perspective on then what is the power of impact? Because ultimately, we are working towards generating some impact. How would you, uh, you know, translate that impact goes to these marginalized communities? Because often, you know, networking and, you know, sorry to say conferences and all are becoming very at the, uh, you know, higher level. And, uh, you know, how do we uh, generate the power of impact then? It's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll share this, that when we talk about, you know, building a professional network, the most exciting piece to us is not that we're, you know, building a, a global network or having summits. It's that we're helping to create the incentives for collaboration and building communities uh, of practice at a grassroots level. So on every single campus now in, in 20 countries, Millennium Fellows are convening every other week throughout the semester to learn from each other's experience. Maybe somebody has a core competency around fundraising or volunteer recruitment or monitoring and evaluation, but now they're really learning from each other. 
Uh, and it's, it's rare, it's so often that doesn't happen. Uh, I, can, I can speak primarily to a campus experience because that's where I focus, but on so many campuses in the US and around the world, it just doesn't happen. You'll have multiple student organizations and initiatives that don't talk to each other. Uh, it's, it's the small minority of students who really, really care and are doing that. But instead of actually linking up and, and finding ways to collaborate, it's like three students over here and two students over here and they're fighting for the same money and the same volunteers and the same media and the same attention. It's silly. It's kind of absurd in how it works, but it's actually, uh, I'm writing about it for a book right now. And part of actually what's happening is that's where the incentives are. The incentives are become the founder CEO of your own organization, uh, put it on your CV, get a little bit of funding, a little bit of media, and then leverage whatever that is, impact or not, to go do the next thing, springboard into the next initiative, the next great job. That's literally like in so many contexts what the incentives are. And so I think we've got to name that and then think about why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, what, does what does impact really mean? For us, impact is really centered on launching young people into social impact careers. Honestly, I would be so proud if our alumni of the Millennium Fellowship are, are in, in, you know, in the next five, 10 years, sitting in your shoes, like sitting where you are as, a, as an Atlas Core fellow, as an Atlas Core scholar, that to me would be like the dream. And so, you know, how we get there, I think is really by um, trusting young people. A lot of people have said to me, you know, how do you really build trust with young people? Uh, my answer is because we trust them. Like if, if you actually trust people, uh, trust young people and trust people in community, that can be reciprocated. If you don't and you objectify people and you treat people as objects, it won't happen. So with respect to impact, we've kind of defined what that looks like for the Millennium Fellowship. But in terms of a local context, uh, I think it's important also for us, like sitting here in Boston, not to be presumptuous and think we know what impact is going to be needed at a grassroots level around the world. And so much of international development over five, six decades has been precisely that. So we really let young people drive the agenda in community. Here are the things that they want to see happen locally um, and just be in solidarity with them so they can be in solidarity with community. It's a great question, though, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss further one on one. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Sam, I want to do a quick time, time check. How's your time? Are you able to stick around for 10 to 15 more minutes? Sure. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Excellent. Well, as long as we're, we've got the questions, I encourage everyone to stick around. We're going to go over time a little bit. Um, so, Patricia, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Abby. And uh, Sam, really inspiring stories. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Sam, I was just wondering on, uh, so the, the idea of uh, not being afraid to talk to anyone uh, is is definitely bold when 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 you consider cultural backgrounds and uh, as some, some a cultural background as diverse as that is here at Atlas Core. So, uh, how has been? Uh, if, I mean, if you can just share any of your experiences or experiences of others where they don't belong to uh, uh, maybe a country or a society where it's it's not that feasible for for someone someone to just go up to. The president. I mean, the president's case is way too far, but uh, let's talk about at least CEOs. So, uh, can you just share some light on that? Yeah. Um, obviously, when I'm giving a presentation, I'm giving you. So I'm trying to give you kind of condensed, uh, almost. Yeah, I mean, it's a condensed version of 13 years into three pieces of advice. Um, it's not that simple, right? And both internally and externally. Internally, even for me as somebody who's white and male and American and being where I am, there are plenty of times when I'm afraid to talk to somebody and, and that's okay. Um, I think the point isn't not to be afraid, but it's, it's to really find the courage to take that risk, to step out of our comfort zone when we can. With respect to being in different spaces and contexts, uh, completely. And so what that means is, one, it might mean, you know, framing it differently. So whether, whether there's a comfort with doing it in person versus over the phone versus over email or social media or WhatsApp, um, you know, finding the medium that works is going to be different in different contexts and spaces. Um, and in some, and in some respects around the world and in different communities and cultures and spaces, 
it may actually be inappropriate to reach out to certain people just, you know, cold and say, here's who I am. And it may not be received well. So I, I name that and I know that. Um, I, ha I can share that, you know, working with different Millennium Fellows, I've seen them reach out to global leaders uh, and get responses that are positive. Um, you know, and, and that's happened enough times for me over 13 years where I, I see this trend happen. Uh, I know that it's feasible. And I know that, again, the mediums that are chosen and the way that the content is communicated might be different in different spaces. And there might be some doors that are closed to young leaders. That is just uh, a practical reality of the world we're in. Um, but I've also seen plenty of times where it does work. Um, and so whether it's like reaching out to a local government official or local media, or even obviously we work with university students, so having students reach out to their vice chancellor or their university president and say, here's what I'm working on and actually get a positive response. And I've, we've had many Millennium Fellows who get meetings with their vice chancellor, the head of their university to share their Millennium Fellowship project, get a photo op together, get written up in campus media. Here's like a positive story of what students are doing. And those little examples honestly may seem so small but in the context of a young leader at an undergraduate level, it's transformative uh, to have that kind of that kind of validation from the head of your university. So I've seen that at least at a university level. I don't want to step beyond my lived experience and our Millennium Fellows and start to opine on things that I'm not qualified to. Um, but I'll simply offer that that at least in a, at an undergraduate level, we've seen it work and get results. Um, and so often I think it was just, there wasn't like a clear rationale or reason for why they were engaging the university, you know, VC uh, and, or I don't want to speculate too much, but you know, maybe they thought, oh, it's, it's the vice chancellor, they're too important. And so at least just keeping bearing in mind that everyone's just a person, um, you know, they may have a big title, et cetera. But what I found is that, you know, at the end of the day, people want to connect more often than not they do. I'll share one other just story from personal experience that reminded me of that. I, I had just given a, a similar talk to this at, at Bentley University and a student pulled me aside and they said, hey, can we grab coffee right now and, and talk? And you know, it's kind of presumption, like it's kind of audacious. I, it was like leaving the school and he's like, hey, can we talk right now? So I said, okay. And we sat and we talked and he shared his passions and, and it was great. And so the next day I was at an event uh, and at this event was uh, Ban Ki-moon, the former secretary general of the UN. And, uh, and I thought to myself like, you know, okay, he's the former SG, he's very you know, important and influential and is it really appropriate for me to say anything? And then I see him there and I think to myself, you know, that that student pulled me aside and and he's you know he's a student but he felt the need like he felt compelled so i i came up and uh, you know we connected and i i said your excellency like could could we grab a coffee can we sit down and and this is like during the lunch i just made this ask and and he kind of looked at me and he's like well sam this is my wife over here and like we're like actually about to fly off we're you know going back to seoul like you know, he's got, he's got a few things in his itinerary, but he said, uh, hold on. He pulled out his card. He wrote down his, you know, his, his email address and he handed it to me. He's like, there you go. And, and, and then I applied all these lessons, followed within 24 hours, et cetera. And he's been so responsive and helpful in, in our journey. And so um, I know that's a singular story. I don't want to take too much from it, except to say that uh, I've seen it work for students, and then I've been inspired by students to recommit myself to this process, and it has worked. Um, but I'm also happy to connect one-on-one -on -one to to help support, you know, if there's more uh, context-specific or culturally specific ways to to really try and apply or adapt uh, these lessons. Great, thank you for that. Um, excellent. So I'm going to go to our final question from Tasia. I, I, I know that we're a little over time. I appreciate Sam's time and everyone else. So Tasia, you'll be our final question and then we'll show our appreciation for Sam at the end. So Tasia. Sure. Hi, Sam. Thank you so much. That presentation was awesome and we love the stories. I am a communications professional. I am 
a fellow from Jamaica and I'm part of class 37. So I get very excited about storytelling and I know it's a good way to have people remember things. Um, and I remembered a lot of things that you shared, but one of the things that stuck out to me was um, just your ability to conquer your fear, conquer like, you know, a feeling of intimidation, do it anyway, be the first. Um, can you share with us like one of the things that has been a challenge from the beginning, it still is a challenge, you're fighting with this challenge still. And I know we have that as social change leaders from people management right up to just like realities. I mean, now we're in the middle of a pandemic, who could have seen this coming? But I mean, just to kind of have an insight of, you know, some realities of the things that, you know, you struggle with as a social change leader has been a struggle and it continues to be. Uh, it's a long list. Uh, I, I won't, I won't, you know, take up all of your time to, to run through the entire list, but you are social entrepreneurs and change leaders and you understand better than well, probably anyone how hard the work is, how lonely the work is. Um, I'd say as somebody running an NGO, uh, just fundraising is, is a challenge. And especially doing youth leadership development, um, that is pretty niche. You know, there's a study from McKinsey that said um, in the last two decades, uh, major foundations contributed just 1% of funds to leadership development for our space, 1%. Um, so the fact that you know programs like atlas core exist it's extraordinary like it, particularly through that lens of philanthropy um and because we're working with undergrads it's not like they have a lot of income to then throw at a program like ours so we're just there are a lot of constraints um i'll share maybe i'll just share in closing this story which is when we started out we had no funds we started in our university dorm rooms um, I, I found a contact at the United Nations. They didn't know me. Um, I reached out directly to them and I said, you know, I'd love a meeting. I used the process that I shared here. And so I got that initial meeting with the UN. I asked for funding. They said, no. I asked for funding a second time. They said, absolutely not. Um, I, I asked for funding a third time. They said, no. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, just having persistence, I think, is key. And we had our first summit, as I referenced at MIT. And then I, I'll never forget, I went back to Anita Sharma, who was working at the UN at the time. And I asked for, I, I had a budget and I, I was hoping, I was internally, I was hoping for two or three thousand dollars. And I looked down, she looked down at her budget. She looked back up at me and she said, Sam, how about 20 to 30 thousand dollars? I said, 30 thousand sounds great. That, and that was our seed funding. That's really how we launched MCN. And so I would just encourage you and everyone, some doors are going to close. That's okay. Uh, some doors will be maybe closed for now, but they could open later. So just keeping people up to date on your journey, because you never know when that door might open up. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it's, you know, it's a persistent challenge. Um, but where I've stayed focused is really one, my North Star being rooted to that, looking up and remembering that I'm doing this work because I believe wholeheartedly in the power of young people to make a difference. Uh, and, <clears throat> and that young people are my greatest teachers uh, throughout my life. This question that I wanted to leave you with, that, that's on the screen now, uh, was from Layla in Morocco after my presentation in Agadir. She asked this simple question in an email to me, how do we create an awareness in the heart of people? Uh, it's so simple yet so profound and I realized this was seven years ago and I realized the question really wasn't meant for me to answer because how could I possibly answer this question? Uh, it's really one that I meant to, to share with others, uh, to pass along, um, to really wonder together about how we create a world with greater dignity. And, uh, and I don't have that answer. There's a lot of biases that I carry. There's a lot that I don't know. There's a lot that I'm learning. That's why I'm a student again is to you know, keep learning and refining and growing, but uh, I do know that working together with leaders like Atlas Core Fellows and Scholars, we are going to create the world uh, that I know we all want to live in, a more just world. And so I, I just want to say to you and, and to everybody in the community uh, at Atlas Core, thank you for what you do and thank you for how you lead. And, and I'm really honored to be with you today.
Well, thank you, Sam. Inspiring as always. And what an amazing thing to lead on. Leave on. How do you create an awareness in the heart of people? So, um, fellows, please join me in show me, showing your appreciation. You can do a reaction, hands in the air. Uh, Sam, we very much appreciate you. And uh, we thank you for these inspiring words. Really something to think about and something to go forth with. So, um, on that note, I